and welcome to Brainstorming America. I'm Ken Rollins, and you're with John Merrill. And uh, John, we've we've had a lot of things happening since we were here last time, and uh, let's just go into some of them. First of all, did you notice how they uh, have started spray tanning Joe Biden? Trying to give him a little color. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. Yeah, he's looking it. a little pale. He's, he's well, not he as strong like as he used to be, and he's not as healthy as he used to be. So they're trying to give him some artificial cover and artificial flavoring. Well, it went too much one time. He looked like the orange man for a little bit there. And I was thinking, oh, <laughs> Lord. Next thing you'll do is come out with a blonde toupee. Well, it's funny because some people call President Trump the orange man. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. But it's, it's funny. But, but it, it it's was translated uh, over to President Biden. It did. He, he come out and we go, whoa, what was that? And my daughter said, you looking at TV? I said, yes. She said, what's wrong with Joe Biden? I said, he got him a, a spray tan, and he won't look like the orange man. She said, well, he does. She said, that's what I was going to tell you. <laughs> but anyhow, it, it, he, uh, it's the, the limits that people will go to try to get, get down on their opponent, but to get down on me to convince me that he's 20 years younger by spray tan itself. That's what, that's what that was all about, to convince the public who y'all are so gullible sometimes that a little spray tan and say, oh, I look how young uh, Joe is, but don't fall for that stuff, someone. But anyhow, um, he slipped up, and this is something that boils my blood. He talking about his son, Bo, getting killed in Iraq. Last week, he's talking about that, right before he went back in the basement with uh, COVID. My son, Bo, died in Iraq, and I'm this, I'm that. His son died of a brain problem. Brain tumor. Yeah. In 2015. But he was not a victim of uh, No, he war. was an Iraqi war veteran, and he right. was someone that had fought for our country and somebody Absolutely. that had served honorably. But he died of a brain tumor. Sure did. But I, I as just a matter thought, of fact, as a matter of fact, President Biden actually wrote a book about that, and he titled the book, Promise Me Dad, which is something that Bo said to him about honoring his commitment to our country and serving our country in an honorable way. So the president actually recounts what occurred in Bo's illness and the result of Bo's illness, of course, being his untimely and unfortunate death. But he died of a brain tumor. Are you saying that that Bo told Joe, promise me, Dad, that you'll run, serve? Yes, and that's all in the book. Okay. I haven't read that. Yes, sir. But yeah, I thought it was he run because uh, those people come, Trump talked about those people with torches coming out of the, with their Nazi flags and stuff. I thought that was what he ran for. Well, I think there are a number of reasons that President Biden chose okay. to run against President Trump. Wherever he's at that, that day. Exactly. And, and with corn pop. I was going to say, what does corn pop have to do with that? I think he rub, rubbed his hair on his leg down in the swimming pool. <laughs> and they like to watch him when they dried out, the hairs would pop back up. And he loved little kids sitting in his lap. I remember all of that stuff, man. That just was a pervert. And he took a, <laughs> took a shower with his daughter. <laughs> took, I mean, that's in her book. She told about, as a teenager, <laughs> taking showers with her dad. That's a messed up bunch of people. And I watched old uh, Kamala's husband lock lips with, uh, what's her name, uh, Joe's wife? Jill. Jill, not yes, Dr. Jill. the first Jill. lady, Dr. But Jill they Biden. Lock, they lock lips from national television. And I'm not talking about a peck. I'm talking about locking lips, swapping sugar, swapping slobber. <laughs> sure did. Did you see that? I did not see that. Oh, man, I wish I had that clip. I bet I can Google and find it. Um, another thing that's got me concerned, if we have 190,000 uh, children, unaccompanied children running loose in this country somewhere, where can 190,000 children and I'm talking about juvenile down to where are they located at this time? They were they were brought over here across the border. They're in America. 
but nobody has any idea where. You know, you don't drive down the road and see kids running all over the place. That's right. So if there's 190,000 unaccompanied children in this country, where might they be? Then, and if I was the president that had allowed them to come in here, I think just from 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 the heart, you would want to know: Are these kids okay? Are well, they, if you remember, Ken, one of the things that the Democratic Party talked so ferociously about was how President Trump had separated children from their parents as they were coming into the country illegally during the time that he was in office. And of course, uh, there were camp areas where people were evaluated and assessed and sorted. And now with the things that have happened during the last three and a half years as President Biden has been our chief executive, we've seen a number of children that have been brought here by mules uh, and I don't mean animals, I mean people that have been paid to bring them here illegally and to leave them here. And so we see that happen in all near the border towns throughout the United States, in Arizona, in Texas, throughout all parts of our nation. And But I see the, the thing that I'm saying, you know, if we, they turn these kids loose, I got to think that these kids have been sold into sex slaves or something to that effect, because they're not all two or three years old. These are nine, 10, 11 uh, little girls and boys that uh, any number of things could have happened to them. But Yes, sir, but one of the things that we want to make sure that our viewers know, if you see them, call us and we'll call the Enforcement Bureau to make sure that they're picked up. But in the meantime, we'll follow up with you right after this break on Brainstorm in America. Welcome back to Brainstorming America. Ken Ross here with John Merrill. And uh, John, we were talking about the 190,000 children that uh, are unaccompanied here in the United States. And we, we need to make sure that everyone here, if you're on the interstate or wherever, keep your eyes out because these kids are being moved, transported right under our eyes. And I saw the reason I want you to do that is I saw a rental truck, one of the big ones, and the back door was down except for a place about yay big, had some towels that kept it from closing all the way. Somebody right outside of Atlanta saw a little hand move under that door that was following that truck. They called 911 and stayed following that truck all along until right outside uh, on going north on 75, the police came. Uh, they opened the door and there like 20 something people in the back of that van mm. being transported. Only because of somebody looking, seeing something, that little crack in the bottom of there, and saw a little hand move. The hand was not waving at those people, but it just moved across because that kid was shifting their self around in the bottom of that van. And that caused this person to call 911. So if you, especially the one of the, I-20 is one of the corridors that our police chief says is a, from Texas through here to Atlanta to the East Coast, it's and as big. the motto says, Ken, if you see something, say, say something. something yeah. We need to make sure that we're reporting things that we see that could be a dangerous situation where someone's life is at risk, where someone is not being properly attended to or given the appropriate attention to live the kind of quality of life that we would hope all of our children are able to live. And when you're talking about having child trafficking the way that we're seeing it not just on this corridor, the east-west corridor on I-20 that runs from Texas all the way to the, the eastern coast, uh, we want to make sure that we're properly reporting it so it can be appropriately investigated when necessary. That's, that's exactly what we're trying to do here is to uh, enlighten that just because you see it on TV don't mean it couldn't happen on Interstate 20 right out our back door here. And uh, that's where a lot of the traffic trafficking is coming from, like uh, John said, from Texas to 
East Coast, this is a this is a thoroughfare. And our police chief is on this show told about how things these exits if you out of the exit look at look at things going wrong. If you see an old man way up there that you know that he's a granddaddy type person and he got a little young girl with him or young boy, watch that person real well. There's, there's a reason there why that old man got this child and that's where a lot of your trafficking is uh, is caught. So you be the hero and, and be the person that stops that something, part of it. Uh, let's see. The assassination attempt on Donald Trump. That's a, there's a lot to talk about there, but I'm going to start the conversation. Did you notice how DEI was working that Donald Trump being a tall man, the Secret Service had little girls out there, four feet five, to, to protect. It wasn't working very well. When it they wasn't. were trying to cover the president after he was uh, attempted, uh, assassination occurred, when he stood up, uh, you could see him, he was completely exposed. And Blood of course, I know that some of the um, Secret Service people were very concerned that the president was lifting his arm up and that he was hollering, fight, fight, fight. But the thing, the image that continues to be promoted in the DEI narrative is of the Secret Service agent that could not even reholster her weapon once she was assigned to be outside the SUV where the president was going to be transported to the hospital. Now, subsequently, I have discovered that that individual is not part of the Secret Service detail that was assigned to the president. That individual is actually assigned to work in the Pittsburgh office of the Secret Service, just like we have one in Birmingham, uh, we have one in Atlanta. They're in all different parts of the country. And whenever the president or a significant dignitary comes into that particular area, that person is assigned to assist the Secret Service agents. And that's where her assignment is, is in Pittsburgh. But she did not honor the Pittsburgh office. She embarrassed the Pittsburgh office and she embarrassed the people that were a part of that detail because they viewed the Secret Service detail as being ineffective, as being inoperable, as being um, unable to perform their task. And that was unfortunate for all the people that are associated with Secret Service detail. That was uh, embarrassing to America to say that she was trying to reholster her pistol, which what she was doing was very dangerous too, that, that the fingers gets moved in all that process to a point that she, the, the goes off. There were people down below laying in the dirt or laying in the grass. So the downward uh, projectile from that pistol, she could have shot others. She was mishandling, to say the least, a dangerous weapon. She never did, well, I thought she did it finally, got it reholstered, but not before she put people's lives at stake. And bless her heart, she, my point is she should have never been out there. She should have been back at that desk wherever she's supposed to work. She was not the appropriate person to be assigned for the presidential detail. Absolutely. But we know that you are the appropriate person that's assigned to watch this episode, the 66th episode of Brainstorm in America. Thank you for joining us. Come back with us right after this break for the final segment of this week's episode. Welcome back to Brainstorm America. Ken Rollins here with John Merrill. And John, uh, the Secret Service, uh, when all this attempt happened on uh, June, July the 13th on uh, President Trump, uh, they waited till the shooter took a shot before they shot, but they had had him in their crosshairs way before then. I don't get the explanations or lack of explanations they've been given. What's your thoughts on that? Yeah, the protocol is when you see the president or the person that the executive security detail is in charge of protecting, when you see an individual at risk, 
then you're supposed to take action, and action was not taken. So that's one of the reasons why I don't think the end of this story has been told in spite of the fact that the Secret Service Director has resigned. She's no longer in that role. There is an active person in that role who's serving as the temporary director. But there are questions that have to be responded to as to why they elected not to discharge their firearms until after the assailant attempted to discharge his firearm, which put the president and those other individuals, all three of them that were struck, one that was killed and two other that were mortally wounded, uh, at risk. And if they had actually eliminated the suspect uh, initially, then those individuals would not have been harmed and everybody would have been better off because the assailant would have been removed and terminated from that particular point in the discussion. I know you've been around uh, President Trump a lot, but I had back in, uh, I guess it's 70s, late 70s, 80s, uh, Jimmy Carter was running against uh, uh, Ronald Reagan. And I was in Texas, Beaumont, Texas. And um, they, we had a house band, uh, Texas Tradition was the name of the band. They were well known. I, I was over them. Uh, I've had a booking agency there, and the band worked for me. And uh, somehow, when we knew we knew Jimmy Carter was coming to town, and the Secret Service came out here that one night. And I want to tell the people this to show you what goes into uh, some of the lay work that goes into to a president coming to your town. The Secret Service arrived nearly two weeks prior to Carter coming into town. And they wanted to meet everybody in the band that was going to be near him. Yes, and they call that the advanced detail for those right. that have not been involved before. And they had questions for each one of them. And they had information from Social Security number to whatever. They did background checks on every one of the band members because they were going to be on the stage playing drums or whatever while the president was there. So we, uh, for them two weeks, they was out there regulars at the club. And sometimes they'd talk to you, sometimes they didn't. You know, they were just there observing. But sometimes they'd go up to a band member and ask certain questions. And they would tell us what to ask them. They says, when you was... Uh, Working in Minneapolis, you played with, they'd ask them personal questions about their history. So they're really getting to know the band. So we go out, he lands, he plays at uh, Beaumont. And uh, the person that was supposed to introduce uh, Carter didn't get on stage fast enough and they go, go ahead, go ahead. So I introduced the president. And the band played a song called The Devil Went Down to Georgia. They changed the words to, well, Reagan went down to Georgia. He was in a bind, way behind, looking for some votes to steal, blah, blah, blah. And they played that during, during his time up there. And so Carter left to go to Port Arthur just a few miles away. And they wanted their band to keep playing, to hold the crowd there while Carter was away. And so when he came back, there'd be people to photograph. So the band played and all that stuff. And they, everybody wanted a copy of that, that song that they rewrote. So they went on to Air Force One and made copies like you wouldn't believe. Everybody, all the press was given a handout. But those the details that that Secret Service, we had a pen, every one of us had a small little pen, very not noticeable, but, but if you look for it, you'd see it. And each one of us was identified. So, and we were in a place, the press was over here, nobody got out of their place. So, I'm telling you that to let you know that there's a lot goes into, there was three limousines l unloaded prior to Carter ever getting there. These, these vehicles were unloaded. 
and I noticed them wiping them down to make sure they shine. But they was a, there's a whole lot that goes into protecting the president and their their party. But uh, when you see what happened here, you, they treat Donald Trump the same as they'd treat Biden for his protection. Absolutely, and, and they uh, should. And I noticed that uh, J uh, Kennedy got protection right after that. He did. He should. Have and I was people. actually with him at the Republican National Convention in Milwaukee. Who? I had a private meeting with Robert Kennedy Jr. and had some interaction with him and his Secret Service detail was there with him and we talked about that while we were there together. Well. Uh, he was um, meeting with donors, he was meeting with other individuals, he met with some Republicans that were there. I had a meeting with members of the Republican National Committee that were there at that time and then ended up meeting with Robert Kennedy Jr. before I left the hotel to go back to the convention site. He's a big environmentalist. Um, he's got an organization that that uh, is just about that. And working depot, my job is that, environmental coordinator. And I had to go to a uh, con meeting in Washington, D.C., of which Robert Kennedy was a head of. And we met at the Washingtonian, which is one block over from the White House. And Robert Kennedy and I had lunch together, and I told him who I was from Anniston. And I said, we got a little problem with ADM in Montgomery, and they filed a suit on us. But we've not discharged anything to the outside. But it's just paperwork, really. He said, oh, you have nothing to worry about there. It, it, I know that case. There's nothing going to happen. We're not going to. Two weeks later, man, got a lawsuit for $40,000. Right. And no the doubt about paid it. it. I said, Robert Kennedy, I hate your good. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of lawsuits, we're excited that you continue to join us and that you have yet to file a lawsuit on us. <laughs> we are so thankful for your viewership each and every week. We'll see you next week as we return with Brainstorm in America.